This is the 10th of December. We're in Macon, Georgia. I'm about to interview Professor Joseph Hendricks and I am Stephen Tuck. And it's 1993. When were you born and brought up in Macon? I was not. I was uh, born about 60 miles west of here mm -hmm. in a, a very rural county called Talbot, after Matthew Talbot in the old country. You know. <laughs> and uh, very, very rural area. In fact, now it's listed as one of the poorest counties in Georgia. Right. Yeah. And when did you come from there to? And I you? came from there when I was, that was 1934 was my birth. In 1951, I enrolled at Mercer. I right. just turned 17 okay. and uh, came here to go to go to college. Right. Um, looking back on 1951 when you arrived and obviously focusing on civil rights, what would you, how would you describe the racial situation in Macon? Two ways to answer that question. From where I sat looking at it as a 17-year-old, mm. it was not even an issue. Right. It was not even an issue uh, out in the community as far as the public press and so on was mm. going on. I want to modify that in a moment. Uh, mm. There were, however, and in truth, one, one dimension of the whole civil rights process emanates from the campuses. Principally this one, Wesley and I here had a role from time to time, but it was not as aggressive as this one. Mm -hmm. And this was being carried uh, through the years by just two or three professors here, one of them who's still living, mm -hmm. and I'll give you his name, I think you might want to call him, McLeod Bryan, mm -hmm. Dr. McLeod Bryan, uh, graduate of Wake Forest College, educated at Yale, and uh, he was um, among the things he taught was philosophy and Christian ethics. And so it was he uh, principally who was raising questions. Uh, not only raising questions, but he was involved in uh, numerous activities of a civil rights nature. Uh, uh, most of them off the campus. What sort of thing with those well, for example, uh, there, there was a conclave of people in North Carolina, that's where they were right. centered, called the, and you would pick this up from Dan Carter and uh, maybe Connie Curry, certainly Will Campbell. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Campbell as well. Yes, uh, Will Campbell eventually became a very close friend of mine. In fact, he's writing a book about uh, civil rights on this campus right now picked up some stuff you may want to talk to him uh, but back to Cloud Bryan he uh, he was a sort of a Socratic guy and uh, so he would take students up to work on the this uh, sort of camp for the committee of southern churchmen Will Campbell will later uh, uh, well, it was called Fellowship of Southern Churchmen, and Will Campbell would take it over about 1964, and it would be called the Committee of Southern Churchmen. Mm -hmm. And what it was was just a group of Southern radicals, uh, most of them white, but some black, and uh, they were they were interested in social issues like sharecroppers and so on. Among the people who <coughs> who were connected in some form of that would have been. Uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, the eminent uh, theologian at Union Seminary, Sherwood Eddy, I think. Uh, Do you think it made much of an impression on Mercer itself? Yes, through McLeod Bryan. certainly did on me, yeah. and uh, I never went. Uh, I would many years later, but he was doing more than that. Here also, back as they say on the farm, on the mm -hmm. campus, he was, uh, he had a, for instance, a little paper called a combustible, which would publish sort of radical ideas, and then the other part was called combustible. When you read it, you were supposed to burn it, keep it out of the hands of the uh, people who might uh, take umbrage at it and uh, make difficulty for the camps and all. So <clears throat> what it it was sort of quasi underground, just enough to titillate the students a little bit. And uh, uh, but he was uh, forever uh, 
poking at the segregationist structure. Uh, let me give you another example. A, a person teaching sociology was called Das Kelly Barnett. Das is spelled D-A-S, Kelly Barnett, K-E-L-L-Y. I think the Barnett was B-A-R-N-E-T-T. -T. I'm not sure about that. And he would go uh, public from time to time. For instance, the buses were completely segregated. I mean, uh, as with everything in this town, that was not a breach anywhere that I know of, except the Macon Council on Human Relations. And uh, maybe the YWCA or the YMCA, they were and they were not from time to time. But anyway, Dos Kelly, a little bit of an exhibitionist, so he'd just get on the bus and sit down by it go to the back section and sit by sometimes a black woman and uh, come back and tell the classes about it and the reaction of the whites there. And uh, uh, so he was playing a role. I remember an old English professor who welcomed Talmud Smalley uh, quoting Booker Washington in the class that as long as a white man keeps his keeps the black man or the Negro, as they would have said then, on the, his back, he has to stay on his face to do it. So the thing was being punctured, but it was in very, very, uh, I guess we would say benign ways. There was not, there was, it was, we were far from the confrontational stage, is what I'm getting around to say. Now, one other thing, the Maker Council on Human Relations was meeting during that I was going to ask you about that. Um, when did you get involved with that? Not really until I came back in 1959. Right, so you went away for five years. Back for four years. Right. Well, yes, from, well, from 55 to 59, yes. And when I came back, I became involved, and I guess I was co-chair by 1961. Right. Um, any idea when it was formed and how it was formed? Uh, that's where Gus will have to come into play. Uh, my impression is that it emanates, uh, that was the 50s. I was told that it was went back as far as the 30s, but uh, I don't have any documentation on that. There are no files. No. Uh, I will give you a sort of portrayal of how it looks, say, in 1959. Um, just before you do, did, you ha did it have links with Atlanta? Oh, yes. Do you, any Atlanta names? Yes, Frances Pauly. Right. So she, she would come down here, would she? Well, later on, but uh, she's a link to who went on before. And all of those archives now have been placed in the Emory Library, mm -hmm. 40,000 pieces. And uh, she told me just the other day, she's something like 80 or some odd years old. I've, I've met her. Yeah. Okay, so she tells me all this 40,000 pieces over there and a good bit about... Um, uh, I was going to bring in, I'll show you the, the program for 1964 first, since I happen to have here. Oh, that'd be lovely. Yeah, I can show you the annual report or whatever. It's not going to reveal much, but at least there's a, a document. Mm. But uh, I forget who her predecessors were. Right. But they were, in fact, Macon, and I think maybe one other place was the only place in all the towns in Macon, in, in, in other than Atlanta, who had Council on Human Relations who were trying to deal with this. Really? Um, what she told me, they're just two. I forget whether it was Savannah or some other place. Yeah, Rome as well. Maybe so. Um, what role impact did she have? Francis. How important was it to oh, have an outside link? Oh, it was tremendous, link? but that gets us up into the... She, she comes on about 60, 61, somewhere in there. Okay. So, so let's, let's go back to 50, back 50 to 59. Back in the 50s... Uh, Tell me, yes, when you when you came back to making what was... What was it was the only thing. Right. The NAACP was around, but it was not doing much. It was there. Uh, there was a little labor activity, but that was in the South, there's nothing. The only thing happening that I knew about was the Making Council on Human Relations met once a month. And generally, it was a discussion session, speakers would come, and all of that was important because it at least was maintaining some kind of dynamic tension with the prevailing order. So, who was in the Making Council? Well, not mostly, names, uh, but mostly uh, upper middle class black people, right. and uh, the, the 
the professors, uh, mostly from Mercer, occasionally one from Wesley. And uh, then uh, the inevitable interested, well, Gus Kaufman, for instance, a businessman, uh, who ran a very successful business here. Uh, he was a principal person, and one of the, one of the most important ones. Was so you had your educators mm-hmm. and uh, uh, your liberal businessmen. I don't remember any lawyer, don't remember any doctor. Or any politician? Uh, of course not. Um, of the black people involved, would that be people like Mr. Randall? Well, actually, he comes in, uh, I think before him, uh, I have to put this very carefully, uh, he sort of arrived uh, along with me and others who were of a more activistic kind of mode, in a more activistic kind of mode. Before that, it was like Ms. Mosley and Fisher Mosley, who were the funeral directors, uh, William Hutchins, a Hutchins funeral home is still here, uh, and a few occasional minister, and uh, folks like that, uh, the rank and file, right. I don't know, these were the kind, it was a, more of a genteel mm-hmm. gathering of the people who were left of center, but not all that far left of center, right. and, uh, but they kept they kept hope alive, to use uh, one of Jesse Jackson's terms. Uh, uh, at least there was a conversation. And I recall, even when I was a student here, going to one state meeting that was held here. You got the Atlanta people in, you sort of up the, the conversation there a bit. Right. Did you have any concrete goals, or was it more just communication? Well, one of the... Uh, there was, as I recall back then, because uh, I, uh, I was, in, was around during the transition, uh, it was a response organization when some outrageous something happened, uh, and uh, we would intercede and try to you know, get uh, whatever justice was possible in a segregation society. Mm-hmm. But then, as the 60s came moving along, mm-hmm. we'll flash up there and then get back. Then it became uh, it became an organization which uh, supported the, what became principally the black movement. Mm-hmm. So you move from where you have a sort of thin coalition mm-hmm. of educated uh, educators and black leaders and so on, we called them Negro then. Mm-hmm. Uh, two, where it then makes a transformation into a more activistic agency supporting uh, what then is emerging into a movement as the 60s come into play. Right. So you're, as I hear you, your overview of before the 60s would be the odd thing happening here and there in the college, just the odd sort of um, individual rather than the movement. And then in the 50s, the beginnings of conversation and hope. But it, you wouldn't, would you draw a direct link from the organizations and the events of the 50s to the 60s? Would you just say that, what I'm trying to say is, would you put the making counts on human relations and these professors as, as the roots of what happened in the 60s? Or do you think no, no. what happened in the 60s was no. started completely no. differently? I think they, I think they help to make the ground fertile right. for what, but uh, if you had were depending on an organization like the Council on Human Relations to bring about massive social change, it never would have happened. Right. But it was what made Macon got through, uh, Stephen, the entire period, for better or worse, I think for better, without any major disturbance. I mean, uh, there were no riots, there were no massive, uh, I'll tell you some of the things that did happen, but I think the reason that happened was that there were some enlightened uh, forces at work that were able to come in and and play uh, as the civil rights movement uh, began. Uh, In earnest, uh, for example, we can get the exact dates, uh, the, the, the bus boycott. Right. 
uh, here in Macon was uh, just about total, amazingly. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we had uh, the council was supporting that and uh, uh, various other initiatives that were taken back there. That's that was February, February 62. Yeah, so February 62, I remember. Let me just give you an example for you. Do. Uh, examples and anecdotes are the best. All right, here's an anecdote. <laughs> Great. Bill Randall wanted to talk the ministers into getting on the bus and being arrested. And so he calls me and says, Joe, will you come down here and help me talk to the ministers to get them on that bus? Mm -hmm. Now, that's kind of stuff that went on. Uh, when we had the sit-ins, which became the expected thing to do, we would, uh, we can find the papers on that too. I don't know, it would have been 62, somewhere in there, 63. 62. We were the observers, uh, going just in case of violence. So, you know, if the council hadn't been there, and the movement would have been out in the limbs. Would, uh, would not have had contact with, uh, and, and we were able to give it just enough of a, uh, interracial flavor that it couldn't be said it was just the blacks making trouble and all, which would be last. So, um, so these are white ministers you got on the boat? No, no, black ministers. Right, friends of yours. That sound, that was, uh, no, they were, they were friends of ours, but they were even more friends of Randall's. Right. But this all sounds out of the time warp now. Right. I'm just telling you what happened. He'll tell you the same thing. Right. But so he asked you to get in touch with Oh, them. yeah. Well, well, he asked me to come down to Stuart Chapel Church, which I did. Right. And what I told him was if they didn't get out in front of their people, they were going to be worse off than white ministers and so on. And, uh, I see. So yeah. you were, right, I see. So he was asking you to help galvanize the black Absolutely. Ministers. Now, uh, the uh, other way... That's not the kind of thing that makes for good press later on now. No. This is early on. That's the story... All around the south. Yeah. Um, just moving further on, when you had negotiations by racial committees to um, sort out the sit-ins and the bus boycott, would council members be involved in that? Usually well? in the background. We would go if they were asked to, uh, but by that time the blacks are looking after themselves right. uh, increasingly. They don't need us. They have Donald Hollowell coming in, for instance, a name right. you'll run into. Uh, mm -hmm. Thomas Jackson, who, by the way, you need to talk to here if you want to, an attorney, uh, who would come in from Boston or someplace, I forget what, but a very fine friend of mine, mm -hmm. and uh, he was emerging as sort of the local attorney mm -hmm. uh, for the for the movement, as we called it back then, and so. Uh, uh, they were able to take care of very handily their own negotiations, mm -hmm. and, uh, but we would provide resource stuff. I remember being on hand several times uh, when there were particular situations. And get on up toward 1965, the hospital was recalcitrant, and uh, I by that time was working as a consultant for some of the compliance agencies or what, and uh, Randall and I went to the hospital commission mm -hmm. together. And we sat there in the morning and told me we're going to have to be served And uh, Earl Worm, Armstrong Court chairman, was chair. He didn't like what we were about. But, uh, of course, by then we had the 64 law, and so we had the weight of litigation behind, I mean, legislation behind us. But uh, uh, up, one, one marker thing, through the 60s, uh, there was a lot of collaboration with black and white leaders in America move the process along. In Macon? In Macon. Mm -hmm. The example one I just gave you, that we were all night sessions with <laughs> the hospital authority about how uh, that they were just going to have to desegregate the hospital. This was as late as 65 or 66. And, uh, so. Now Mercer itself, the desegregation of Mercer, uh, Mr. Samuels was it? The first two black students? No, no, no. Uh, Sam Jerry Oney. Right. In fact, the book's being written about that right now that you can access in the spring, ought to come out in the early spring, early summer, or fall by Campbell. And extensive research, and in fact, I'll invite you to something if you want to come. On January the 12th, we're having the 30th anniversary of all of that right over here in the chapel. Yeah. 200 yards away, Sam Oney is being brought back from Africa, Nigeria. Uh, 
uh, lives in late Victoria on that area, <laughs> by the way. It was a thing I never forget at Bourbon at Buckingham Palace is you know, Queen Imperatrix right there, you know. Uh, look at old Empire. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, uh, he's coming back with his wife. He first married an American wife and uh, has two children. And so the university's given quite a, uh, which you couldn't do back then, to the celebration. So he was a, uh, I don't know how you would handle this, a missionary convert, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, at least he was a Christian. Mm -hmm. and, uh, first Ghana and then Nigeria, and this is an incredible story, a missionary graduated class in 1955. Now this is an example, but this is a good example, Stephen, mm -hmm. of what I was trying to get across about the 50s. Mm -hmm. A student of McLeod Bryan goes off a minister to be a missionary in Africa. He encourages Sam Jerry Oney to apply to his alma mater and, and uh, roughly 62, 63, he was admitted. Mm -hmm. Took one hell of a uh, push to open it up. Two other uh, American blacks come the same year. Right, that would be Robert Brown. No, no, Robert Brown comes later. He said right. he, uh, they, they were Benny Stevens, right. uh, who lives at Jonesboro, Georgia now. He's a lieutenant colonel, retired. Mm -hmm. And Cecil Dewberry, who was a transfer student, Cecil Dewberry, D-E-W-B-E-R-R-Y, mm -hmm. <coughs> who uh, was a native of Cincinnati, and still he works at Seagram's interest is there now. But, but this chap from Ni the story you were saying? Nigeria. Yes. Yeah, the student from uh, Mr. Right. McLeod Bryan's McLeod class. Bryan. I mean, he was one of my Brian, McLeod Bryan's students. Went to Nigeria. Site. That's right. And because of him, Sam only applied. Right. Now, what he was trying to do, he was a, he could talk to him, he's going to be here, mm -hmm. Harris Mockley. What he was trying to do was what I was trying to do on this side was to get the place integrated mm -hmm. in, in large part. Mm -hmm. So, it was a neat move. Here uh, is a Baptist institution going to turn down the application of a Baptist mm -hmm. uh, uh, recommended by a missionary who went from here. Mm -hmm. Now, the missionary also attended his church right over here. Mm -hmm. And when Sam tried to go to that church, it was made a national news all over the world. Nigeria took it, the church wouldn't let him in. Mm -hmm. A church across town did. Uh, all of that is in a book called Ashes for Breakfast. Uh, should you ever want to read it? It's in the archives over here. A short book by the minister now deceased who got fired of it. Hey, it was rough stuff at times. He got fired for? Because uh, blacks came to the church and he didn't turn them away and whatnot. And, uh, and it was assumed that he was complicit and they attempted to get into church. What was the name of the minister? Uh, Thomas J. Holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S, and he along with Gaynor Bryan, G-A-I-N-E-R, Bryan is the last name, I uh, wrote a little book, very small. I don't have a copy of it because Campbell has it, but it's called Ashes for Breakfast. Mm -hmm. and the result of the congregation fired him. What was the name of the missionary who went out to Nigeria? Harris Mobley. Harris Mobley. Yes, he's in Savannah. I could give you his name if you number M O B L E Y. M O B L E Y. Yeah, it's an interesting story. So, um, you said it was a hell of a push to desegregate Mercer to integrate it. The president said, well, let me let me give you a 50s anecdote. Uh, it's going to take something to, to get you into that ethos back there, understandably. 1958, while I was away from here off at the seminary, so we had a person in a wheelchair, handicapped person, and back then you didn't have all of your handicapped facilities and ramps and all, so he was pushed about the campus by a young black man. Mm -hmm. This student's in the same class. Notice how this McLeod Bryan mm -hmm. keeps coming up. Yeah. And McLeod Bryan noticed that the young pusher of a wheelchair, a black man, would push the person in there, and then he would go out and sit in the hall. Couldn't sit. Now, don't you get this? Stephen. Couldn't sit in the class. Had to sit in the hall. Mm -hmm. 
and, and didn't even have to. That's just what you did. It was understood. You just. Uh, and so then Brian noticed that the young man sitting out in the hall was taking notes, listening through the door. And so he called over to the then president and asked if the young man could uh, just sit in the class. We're not talking about being admitted to Mercer. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about filing applications. We're mm -hmm. not talking about the registrar having on the road. Just sitting there and well, answer came back no. Now, do you get that one? Mm -hmm. It's an academic institution, mm -hmm. and a black person cannot even sit in the room with his charge because it's feared that that would upset the constituency mm -hmm. or the constituencies. So five years later, another president, Rufus Harris, who had been president of Tulane and uh, became my mentor, one of my mentors. I later worked for him as his general assistant and stuff like that. I would say to the trustees, I must ask you to do a brave thing. Mm -hmm. In 1962, mm -hmm. Sam was admitted in 1962, I must ask you to do a brave thing. And this was, uh, uh, this was a year or so after the University of Georgia had been integrated, but a great riot uh, took place. You've seen Charlene Hunter Gault's book, no doubt. We use it, by the way, in a course in Boots and Boots. Uh, and so it brought it about. But that was, a, that was a swing of just five years. Yeah. And precipitated by the new president. Yes, and one more cosmopolitan, one from a major university. Right, he was so 65 when he came here to take over Mercer. He had a long career as dean of the law school at Tulane University, which was one of the, back then, was one of the four premier universities in the South, Southern Park University. Now, I was going to ask you a few more general observation questions about Macon. Yeah. How would you compare Macon? The towns in Georgia. Well, it, it really would depend uh, on the on the towns, uh, mm. and uh, I would take a shot at it. I would say that we moved faster than either Columbus or Augusta, who are both on the you know the, mm. uh, as you go south and west down toward Albany, it yeah. gets tougher and tougher. Uh, Savannah uh, always had, it seemed to me, I don't know Savannah that well, but a little bit of a cosmopolitan edge. I don't think cosmopolitan's quite the word, but it was a coastal town. It had influences uh, there. And uh, so I got the impression that it moved, uh, moved along fairly well. As you go north of Macon, you run into less density of black population except maybe for in you know, a city of land and all that sort of stuff. So that makes it more difficult to that make, make it easier or easier. So this is I mean this is the question, it does get harder when you go south and make it That's correct. Especially Why? westward. Yes. Down to southwest Georgia. Yeah. Why is that? Well the density of black population, uh, you don't have you don't have uh, didn't have then uh, educational institutions. You have, you know, back then, the only college in uh, Albany was a black university that was completely, totally segregated. Um, there's no primary college from, uh, if you take I-75 and go to the Florida border, uh, back then, uh, you have pretty much a, it's a wonderful town, but you just didn't have the uh, uh, agencies of change that were around in these other places. Meaning which sort of things? Well, like a mess well, of in distance in Augusta, you had Payne College, a mm -hmm. private school, kept out a good bit over there. It, it kept hope alive. Uh, uh, but I just have to say, if I had to make a choice, I think Macon probably was second out, to, out of, after Atlanta as uh, probably the more progressive uh, mm -hmm. city. Because it desegregated, for instance, yeah. before the National Act. Yes, yes, right? yes. Uh, we desegregated Mercer voluntarily before 1964, which, you know, uh, it's ambiguous just how that act Would was. you say that Macon was very influenced by Atlanta? Um, and thinking well, more here of the, um, 
yeah, yeah, the that power was structure. There were certainly some influences, but... Uh, the idea of what happened in Atlanta was inevitably yeah, going to happen here. I so. think there was a sense of inevitability it was coming along, but um, I, uh, I think... Uh, I think primarily, and I wasn't prepared to answer this question, but let me give it a shot. I think primarily it had to do, though, with the level of leadership of a person like Bill Randall right. and Gus Kaufman and others who had been around, and that they had been at it longer, and uh, we were able to put together a coalition here that some other places didn't have. Uh, Columbus. Uh, uh, Columbus had uh, is an interesting story itself, and it had some forces of change. There were ministers, five Presbyterian ministers, over there, so on. But um, we were able to put together here. It seemed to me back in those days a, uh, a coalition. And as uh, your own research told you, there weren't even council of relay on human relations in the other time. Mm -hmm. I'm well, pretty com I'm pretty confident that if you go back and check with Frances Paula, she organized most of them after she came on as director of the Human Relations mm -hmm. Council in uh, but then the then But um, and I'm not trying to no, catch no, out no, with no, you. No, no, you'll help if you'll push, because I'm having to... You, you're saying that um, whilst the Council on Human Relations helped once a movement started here, it wasn't an agent of change which caused the movement. Well, what, what it helped to do is provide a context for change. Right, exactly. Um, Let me just give an example. Mm. One of the principal members of the council was a newspaper reporter, mm. and he was prominent in the newspaper establishment. Now, I can't tell you how valuable that was. But he didn't write very much, in it? Well, he did and he didn't. You say that it was better than it would have been. Uh, not only better than it would have been, but he was mad. He was a gift. Uh, if you were setting about to desegregate a southern town back mm -hmm. then, and you could somehow hire, steal, co-opt the George Dawes, and put him I can't tell you what a... What was his name? George Dawes. What a leg up you had. Uh, for instance, and what's going to be hard Dulles? for you doing this thing... How do you spell Dawes? G-E-O-R-G-E, -E, just like King George. No, no, the second name. D-O-W-F. Mm. Newspaper reporters aren't going to supposed to be going around surreptitiously writing these kind of things. Have us put them out mm. and then cover them in the paper. Right. Not back then. Right, and this is your statement you're talking about here. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I'm only saying that's the tape. Oh, yeah, right. Right. whatever. Um, right. Um, now... Well, we're on the statement. Tell me about the statement. Oh, well, this is just one of many. It's just written back there just to have to been sort of a, a transitionary point. We need to find out when it was done. But uh, when you get time, you're going to read it. It talks about the new realism in Georgia's official approach to constitutional prohibition against racial discrimination by acting state and local governments and then stated by the Supreme Court cause re-examination of the policy. Right. 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 So I, now we'll you get, get to it. the picture, see. But it's a statement by the Council on Human Relations. Oh, yes. Right, I see. And so the journalist would help you write it and then he would the report wrote it. it. Right, and then he would report that you he, wrote it. He wrote it. But he reported it. We signed it. it. And he reported that you wrote it. He, wrote, he reported that we wrote it. Yeah, okay, I've got that. So, um, but... I understand very clearly what you're saying about uh, agents of change and the influence. That's, that's sort of the idea. But, I mean, the reason why Make and Move as fast as it did, you would say still, was the fact that there was a movement. There were fine leaders like oh. Mr. Randa. The, the NAACP got its act together. There was a, uh, uh, finally, there was a responsiveness. Mm -hmm. The ground, and, and I don't want to make too much of this, it, uh, it was painfully slow. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'll tell you some things that happened uh, later on. It was painfully slow. But a sort of seedbed had been cultivated uh, of responsiveness. So mm -hmm. when the movement came, we were prepared to embrace it. Right. Now, we meaning a very small group of white people right. and a growing number of black people. Right. Now, if you look at the mayor, the Chamber of Commerce, the businessmen, they weren't in favour. No, but how, how hostile were they? Because um, 
Well, it depends on depends on a, a number of things. Uh, when they uh, they soon with with voter registration really rolling in, they needed to get elected. Uh, Politicians are cutting deals with black voting leaders. Now that's one. Uh, forgive me, Ken. turn. That's one you need to get on with the Gus Kaufman. In 19, roughly 59 or 60, Randall, because he headed one little voting organization, mm -hmm. and a Hooper headed another. They were hauled before the grand jury on the charge that they were encouraging block voting. Uh, and uh, hauled up before the same grand jury was Gus Kaufman. Mm -hmm. This was just that, the turn of the decade, the 50s, 60s. Mm -hmm. So I'm answering your question by saying there were voting organizations mm -hmm. uh, of, of black people, very small, and it was usually, uh, they were given money to get out the vote, and it was very quiet. The white politicians never would meet publicly with them. I actually carried money myself from politicians to the black leader, sometimes as much as $3,000, to get out the vote. And uh, But none of this was ever public, and uh, later it would be public and uh, so on, but I'm um, trying to answer your question in the South, that here, uh, let's say a candidate wanted to get elected, mm -hmm. and it's going to be tight, you're going to do the block vote. Here were rabid segregationists who may know of that plan, but they would never know of it. It was just unspoken. Uh, Ed Wilson, I wish he was alive, just died. Law professor got elected primarily with black vote, mm -hmm. uh, largely with black vote. Uh, that was the difference, let's put it that way. And the blacks never felt like he delivered on all that he said he would do. Uh, all we desegregated was a golf course, for example, one of those deals like that. And at that time, the number of black golfers in Georgia would not be many. Uh, the library, public library, was the next thing that was desegregated. Well, all of these were benign uh, uh, things, but it was little, so they lost uh, But these, the the thing back then, you don't even talk about back rooms. You think of back of the back rooms mm -hmm. as to where these kind of arrangements were made. Mm -hmm. But there were the, 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 the black vote was important. Early on, and after the voter registration drives, it became hugely important. Right. But it was operative in the late 50s and 60s. So you'd say, would you label that the major reason why there wasn't intransigence in the past of the city government? Because, for instance, the buses, the downtown stores, they did desegregate. You didn't get the uh, all that hostility that you had in an Albany or America. Well, it was pretty bad. Uh, if the bus boycott, we got by without major violence or any real violence, but it went on for a long period of time. Nothing like Birmingham, but it was uh, several several weeks or so. And uh, but negotiations were going on, and uh, uh, I'm trying to be as helpful to you historically as I can. Well, I read about it in the paper. Really yes. Uh, Don Hollowell came down and Judge Scarlett took about four weeks. Oh, so. uh, probably something like that. And there were actually there instances were of bricks going through windows. Well, there was some, some violence on the edge, but I don't remember. Uh, I remember all of that. I remember great fear. Randall himself was arrested for making a U-turn. That's right. And, and uh, not having a driver's license. Not having a driver's license with him or something like that. I don't remember the exact thing. So there was a lot of tension, was there, during that? Yes, and I was at the mass meeting, which took place right after his arrest, and I think that one of them uh, just sort of uh, sent Randall into orbit as far as a leader. I, I can tell you what he did. He walked out before that crew and said they uh, just stood there, and the whole congregation, I don't guess there were over two or three white people there, just rose up in a massive standing ovation. And then he talked to he he played the role brilliantly. Talked about being arrested for a U-turn. Said they took me down there. And they searched me, fingerprinted me, and you know went through all of that, touching all the nerves, and then said, for making a U-turn. Actually arrested for making a U-turn. So turned that to an advantage, mm -hmm. as a boy and boy adroitly could do mm -hmm. as time went on. But let me just tell you, Stephen, at that particular moment in time, looking back, this is a problem that every historian looks. 
because when you look back, you see or you impose on the events mm. as in a durative continuum. Mm. But back then, I can honestly tell you there's something a participant in. It was one battle at a time. And we just didn't. And we, <coughs> we were greatly enhanced by any small victory. We get on the school system. I will. Uh, Macon was more genteel than some of these other places. But um, this just, is just historically, Macon is more genteel. Yeah. Uh, well, I was talking primarily about the fact there was less overt violence than uh, some places. But hey, let me give you a part of the problem. We're switching around, and <clears throat> maybe we can get this in some focus later on. But for instance, the school board, mm -hmm. controlled public school, was all self-appointed mm -hmm. and self-perpetuated, all males, mm -hmm. all uh, all uh, pretty much aristocrats in the community. Mm -hmm. And so that was a tough nut to crack. So how was, how was that nut? Well, at the time it was cracked with lawsuits. And, and then when uh, and Jackson, I think, took that one on, Hollowell was involved in some of the other stuff, but Jackson took that one on. He's here and talked to him. But the <coughs> point was, the way it was cracked, uh, I mean, when it was time to crack, first of all, they already had boys and girls segregated. Like girls went to Miller, or the guys went over to Lanier. Mm -hmm. And so what would happen is they started off just integrating the 12th grade. Mm -hmm. Well, the 12th grade would graduate, mm -hmm. and then the courts moved slowly, and mm -hmm. finally they began to establish a pencil move, pension movement where the 12th and the 1st, and then the 11th and the 2nd, and on down. That took years. That took years. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, eventually they got rid of the self-appointed board, and... Uh, Self-perpetuated board. Any idea of the time scale here? That's the, that's uh, that stuff we can find. I I would say all that process took at least four or five years. So you're talking about on the one level uh, things moved. Mercer integrated uh, pretty rapidly, and uh, there's an old story there. Mercer. That's when Connie Curry and so much of many of us were involved. Uh, we were moving rapidly. In fact, uh, we had more blacks in Mercer than any state, anybody in the state, numerically, in the University of Georgia. So we raised money to get them and all that sort of thing. But the point is, we were moving, others were moving, but then this other process over here was just tortuous. You just had to duke it out every step and move along. What about opposition? Um, you mentioned the... Uh Cross burning with uh, Mr. Well, Pascal. Well, that's, that's so. minimal. That's that's probably that's fringes opposition. So there was a bit of fringe KKK. Fringe stuff uh, that was offered to. But me. you never I, felt afraid. Is that? I didn't see that as a. I, I'm sure there were some things that happened. That certainly did. Uh, but uh, significant. Because uh, I mean, I read of occasionally cars with white hoodlums going through black neighborhoods and shooting and things. You know, that that. Uh, there wasn't a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, that and you wouldn't, would you describe the uh, the main leaders of business and politicians as sort of, how do I say, rabid segregationists or just more pragmatic? They were more genteel. Uh, they were both uh, genteel recalcitrant yeah. segregationists. You didn't want trouble. They they would like not to have trouble, but they were they were they. It took economics to move them. In what sense? The bus boycott. Mm -hmm. Bus boycott. Uh, uh, sitting in at the lunch counters. Uh, I'm sure that there was a threat of boycott of stores. Right. Uh, for instance, there was direct action. Random, tell you all about that. For the hire clerks downtown, and uh, um, I've once suggested that. Uh, I forget what I suggested. Something other than Mr. Randall would be put on. The downtown council wrote out here to the president and suggested I be fired. Nothing more than make a suggestion. <laughs> um, uh, it, uh, it, but they, there were no leaders that stood and said, whatever happens, we're not going No to George Wallace is. Yeah. Now, Ronnie Thompson was to play a role later on, but I, I think you'd better stay away from that. Uh, it, it was, it was uh, pretty... He's around. He'll talk to you. Mm. 
But just no. tell me about that, because I'm going to see him. Yes, thank you all, too. Uh, I've had conversations with him recently, and uh, he comes on toward the late 60s when things, uh, Lieutenant Cali episode out of Vietnam, uh, uh, it's one that I leave that uh, uh, just... Uh, I mean, how did Mayor Thompson get the nickname Machine Gun Ronnie? Because he shot machine guns and because he had posters uh, uh, called Shoot to Kill and because he drove a tank around through town called the Winky Tank or something rather like that. Uh, he just had all the symbols of, uh, of, uh, he drove a tank through town. Well, uh, he was driven through tank. He had a tank, yes. And uh, now, when he was mayor after the city, things wasn't he? He was mayor later. Yes, he was his mayor there in '68. Uh, uh, I believe it's '68. But yes, he was he was he was mayor in the later decade. But he would be. So most of the issues should have been resolved by then, were they? Well. Coming from coming from over there, uh, let me try to get this into focus. There's so much I, I see and just mm -hmm. take for granted, and uh, I, I realize I've got the context of the conversation. Um, Stephen, the so-called movement, somewhere around 1965, William Manchester says the gear changed in the universe anyway, mm -hmm. somewhere along in there, but from 1965, uh, 66, you're moving into the whole black power stuff. Vietnam is coming heavily into the picture. Uh, assassinations are occurring. Cities are burning. Was right. black power factor here? The black power uh, factor coming in. But then after, uh, after we, and especially as we move toward King's death, mm. uh, a whole different atmosphere begins to emerge. And uh, separatist tendencies could be felt all across the southern regions, the entire nation. And uh, into that world is where Ronnie Thompson comes from. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he draws a line at several points, uh, issues shoot to kill orders or stuff like that. And uh, there were times when uh, I think Macon was on the brink of chaos. I know it was. Mm -hmm. break of confrontation. But that's not typical of the earlier period of desegregation yeah. that you're focusing on. Well, I'm focusing on this period too. Um, what sort of issues brought uh, chaos to a head? Well, I'll give you one. Lots of times they were symbolic. Mm -hmm. uh, the one that came closest to bringing chaos into uh, about was... Uh, the route for the for the protest the route for the poor people's march after King's death. Mm -hmm. He had planned on calling convention. So here are these poor people's caravans coming through from all over the country, headed to Washington and uh, one came to uh, make it. Mm -hmm. And I shall never forget Randall himself. I heard him in the most uh, provocative, uh, provoked move, not provocative move, but provoked move, because Ronnie Thompson, then mayor, was not going to let them march down the main street. And uh, there had been no trouble with that with other mayors. And so uh, uh, that's the only time I ever heard publicly uh, discussions of nonviolent response, of a violent response. Mm -hmm. And, uh, By Randall. Well, Randall was always pretty uh, discreet on that. But I heard him, uh, I heard rhetoric going on in his presence that uh, he would have dissuaded earlier. And uh, he didn't feel that he could do so then. And the idea was if Ronnie Thompson, uh, if the mayor's forces stopped him, including the police, they were going to march anyway. And they just have to... So I remember leaving, leaving the Randall, or leaving the Randall's place, having heard all of that, and going and making calls to several prominent people to tell them to get a hand in there if they could. I don't know what happened, but Ronnie uh, Thompson later did compromise and let the march come down the main thoroughfare. But that's just one example. Mm -hmm. You felt like you were sitting close to a pilot flag all the time. 
So if Thompson had been the mayor in the early 60s, do you think you would have had confrontation in there? I think, a lot more trouble? I think you probably would have. Uh, so Mayor Wilson was Mayor Wilson much more was, was, he was a progressive. He did not take all that many, uh, shall we say, uh, radical stands. In fact, uh, uh, there was a lot of dissatisfaction with his leadership or lack of leadership among black people. He thought he was doing all he could, but they were not uh, convinced of that at all, and they were fairly moderate people. Um, the succession of mayors there were in the same mood, but they did not offend black people. I mean, they were all the offices were always open. The conversation was going on in back channels and sometimes in front channels as well. But uh, Thompson drew the lines, and then the whole country was getting angry and intense. And, uh, uh, you have to recall, Steve, this was a time mm -hmm. when we were moving into days of rage, uh, as Stuart viewed to be a time. Right. Uh, can I change again? Yes. Do you know of anything of the rural areas around me? Oh, yes. What was the um, impact of the maker movement in the rural areas? It, um, it, it was there, but it was not immediate. Mm -hmm. It was not immediate. Uh, uh, Warner Robins, for instance, uh, just uh, which is a city of 40,000 people, did have some activity. We would often cooperate uh, mm -hmm. with the people like that. Some of those are still around. That's just 10, 15 miles away. But the impact on really rural areas like the one I come from as a child, that would be later. Uh, that would be later. In fact, i give you an example. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until 1974 that Talbot County, that I described to you, had its first major uh, engagement. Mm, yes, describe that. Could you describe that? Yes, I'd give you an article about it. Willie Jean character was killed by a policeman, and uh, that led to uh, demonstrations. In fact, the 60s were just sort of reenacted over there. And so it was occasioned by um, police activity. Mm -hmm. Willie Jean Carreker. C A R R E K E R. Uh, that, that, uh, that whole thing is published in a book called Brother to a Dragonfly. No, no, uh, 40 Acres and a Goat by Will Campbell. And I think I have a copy of it somewhere around. Right I could send to you if I can find it. But he writes up what went on over there, and that'd be a good piece to read because mm -hmm. he puts in perspective what happened. Now there were uh, there were Will Campbell from here. No, Will Campbell's from Tennessee, yes. but he's uh, he's one of the deans of the. Uh, he probably the well, I'll give an example. He was the only white person involved invited to the formation of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Right. This, so this isn't the Campbell who's at Mercer. No. But he's, what's he called? That's right. He was a... What's this Campbell called? Oh, I don't know. Well, the one that wrote, wrote Ashes for Breakfast. And no, that is Holmes. Tom Holmes. Right. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, Thomas Holmes, yes. That's now, right. you were talking of somebody that wrote up the... Um, what happened in that little rural community, Talbot County over there, was Will Campbell. But there's, who's writing history of the Merce of the segregation? He's doing that too. Oh, I see. Got you. And now, I expect he's approaching 70 years old, but he's doing that too. So, but let's take Talbot County, because you'll have kept in touch with that. And what was the town in Talbot? Talbotton. Talbotton. Mm -hmm. Now this is, which way from here? West. West, so it's quite near the border. Well, it's 30 miles, about 35 miles from Alabama. Right. And did you visit it regularly? Yeah. Right. Now, would you say that almost nothing happened in the 60s as far as any movement or protest? Well, schools were desegregated, but that was happening uh, to some extent. Uh, the segregation of schools were taking place. 
Uh, my brother was sheriff there. He did not hire the first black deputy until 74. Mm -hmm. That give you a, 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 a notion. Mm -hmm. uh, there was some voting activity taking place, but no, I would say that uh, uh, real civil rights activity was practically not existing. Mm -hmm. Why would that be? As you were saying before, too small? Or? Well, it's too small. Uh, well, it's not necessarily too small, but uh, the change agents aren't there. Right. No students? No, no, no Stoke College. No, uh, uh, the teachers of the school, the black teachers, tended to drive out from Columbus. Mm -hmm. Some of them did, I think. And so uh, it, it's been great change now. It's pretty much run by black people now. Right. But has, it, um, has it got a high percentage of blacks living there? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, but when... Um, Maybe 60, 70 percent, probably 70 percent black. When Willie Jean Carricker was shot, yeah. there was protest. It's obviously been an underground feeling. Protest doesn't come from nowhere. Oh, of course it did. That's a great You had one of the leaders who was a young lady and she was a very effective leader who had come here to Mercer. Mm -hmm. uh, there were others like that. But, then the whole, but the whole civil rights establishment of black uh, leadership came out of Atlanta down there. Oh, to help? Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. Now, what was the name of the lady from here? Can you remember? Sure. She's in it. She's in it, uh, Atlanta. Now, her name is Christine Harnett. She holds a very important position up there. Call on the phone. H-A-R-D-N-E-T-T. -T. Right. Yeah. Talk to her. She'll give you a... It'd be where her. She holds a very prominent position in something like uh, family and children services or something up there. I'm right. glad you talk to her. Um, but she moved to Talbot, did she? No, she was born. Well, she moved from Mercer. Yeah, she just simply went back there from Mercer. That's right, and I believe she may have already finished Mercer or was close to it. I don't remember the exact uh, exactly where she was, but I think she had already completed Mercer and was there for the summer or something. But um, she was very, very helpful in working things through. And both in leading, helping with the protest, and then leading. It went on for a for boycott and all that for several weeks. Right, and this is in 74. 74. Very interesting. Okay, I'll get in touch with her. That's, that's, her, that's her married name, is it, Hardnett? Well, she's not married. She did marry, but she's kept the name Hardnett. She's single. Great. Christine okay. Hardnett lives in Atlanta, so I'll see if I can round up a number of people. I can look it up. Okay, that's, that's very, very interesting, actually. Um, There's nothing else really that springs to mind to ask. Are there things you feel that we've missed? Well, let me, yeah, we are circling the wagon here with a lot of this stuff, and I'm sure what's coming across are just impressions, but that's, that's really great. not the best we can do. That's right. I uh, think in a bacon uh, primarily. Uh, there is, and let me see if I have something in here. Uh, there were other players back there, and mm -hmm. I got into this doing this for. You see if I've got some notes on my schedule. Right. Stephen, back as we moved back into the 40s and 50s, there were issues. Uh, for instance, uh, the Democratic Party had a white primary. That's right, so I know about this in the States. So you've gotten on to a little of that. Have you run into the name Harris Strozier? No. Harris Strozier. How's it spelled Strozier? S-T-R-O-Z-I-E-R. Mm. He was one of those uh, unusual people back there. In fact, I think Harris Strozier was a member. Uh, he actually taught law at Bursa, but he's also a practicing attorney. Mm -hmm. And he was an attorney for those who were trying to overturn the white primary. Mm. And, uh, this is here? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The case was held here, and it was held before T. Hoyt Davis, a federal judge who was a Mercer graduate. But it wasn't a Macon case, though, was no, it? No, it originated in Columbus. The Primus King case. Yeah, Primus King case. 
but it's a mystery to me, and this is something Gus Kaufman can have me see. He's, uh, Gus, it's got me 20 years, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, But uh, the people like Harris Strozier, mm-hmm. who were operating back there, and then another enigma to me is that these federal judges, starting with T. Hort Davis, Mm-hmm. And then Judge Boodle. Uh, mm-hmm. Boodle was a trustee at Mercer, was a federal judge who acted on the Charlene Hunter case and mm-hmm. Hamilton Holmes case in Atlanta. All of that took place here. My impression... That was here as well? Yes. This is the 5th District, is it? I attended it. Right. This is the 5th District Court? The Boodle case, the the, the Boodle, uh, the Strozier case was in the 50s. It may go back to the late right. first That's what I mean. It's post-World War II. No, you misheard me. I you, didn't. Know, you know the King case, because you've already... That was yeah. the Strozier. The Boodle, the Boodle heard the Charlene... No, yeah, I know, but this is the 5th District. Is that right? Here? Or the Central District? No, I think it was 5th. They call it a circuit. Yeah, uh, that's right. They, they call it a circuit, and I believe we were fifth circuit then. I'm not sure. So these were federal judges. Oh, absolutely. And they were quite sympathetic to the. Well, they were Republicans. Mm. Interestingly enough, um, uh, Boodle certainly was, mm. and uh, I think Davis was a Democrat. In fact, I know he was. But uh, Boodle, <coughs> uh, Tuttle, for instance, in the Charlene Hunter case was Republican appointee. Eisenhower. <clears throat> so, uh, what I'm getting around to, that it looks like to me that if now we're trying to focus what was happening before the 60s, it was mainly in the judicial realm. Mm-hmm. I did not see much happening, nothing integrated of any significance whatsoever. But there was an attack on the uh, voting institutions, patterns, political institutions, and so on, and the courts. Uh, played a significant role back there, and there were some making players. Strozia being typical of them. Right. I've asked Gus Kaufman and others, tell me about Strozier. Why in the, mm-hmm. why in the, why in the world did he happen? And uh, uh, all they can say is that he did. And he was from making he was from yeah, Mercer. He was too taught in the Mercer Law School, though that's part time and all I don't know. Now I've got to give you one more. And this is a something that we should have admitted that's coming out of left field. In 1942, mm-hmm. the same Talbot County mm-hmm. that you're going to talk to Christine Hardman, Clarence Jordan, mm-hmm. having been born there, opened Cornelia Farm. Right. Now, that had, and I don't know, I'm so glad we stayed with this, that had a huge impact mm-hmm. on us. I stayed with Cornelia over the summer. Mm-hmm. Had a huge impact on me. Uh, Clarence Jordan was speaking here in the 50s. Mm. I knew him personally. I was born seven miles from him. Mike Bryan, Ray Brewster were taking people down there to visit at the farm, just like you did, only back then uh, you did it at considerable peril. Uh, And uh, he also was counseling people who were avoiding the draft in World War II. Mm-hmm. Go back there. And this was an activism that was entirely grounded in Christian perspective. Mm-hmm. It was not uh, liberal activism like you see in the late 60s. So you ask me if there was any influence. That one was a huge influence. Mm-hmm. And eventually, of course, they would bomb the Mm. operations down there and one of the give you an example that I should have said something there was a family still is a family named Burgey who were into mills not mills like textiles but flour mills Mm -hmm. feed mills things like that and so they were the only ones who refused to go along with the boycott in America their store was bombed and Burgey Herbert Burgey was one was one of the few enlightened, uh, aristocratic, uh, upper elk mm. members of the school board and so on, who helped out during that period. So there's some interaction there. That's a major part of the story that I was about to overlook. Cornelia. So Burgess from here. Yeah. Birdsey is from here. Oh yeah, well, he's dead now. But, but he was from here. His, his, his mill is here. His uh, business is here. B i r d s e y. That's right, Birdsey. And he helped Coinier when there was the boycott on Coinier. Well, he, he continued to sell to him. 
so they accompanied him down there and they just blew the hell out of it. Uh, oh, right, because his company was in America. It, well, an outlet down there. Right. So I want to mention Cornelia, a radical Christian mm. thing over here, that just a wheel of a bunch of stuff been written about Clarence during this very, uh, very important figure in my uh, journey here. Mm. And then uh, there's a whole story around Harry Strozier, why Henry Primus, and all of that. Well, so who, you may not know, I'm interested, but Strozier defended the case, or he, he led the case. Whatever. He mu he can't have done that off his own bat. He must have been hired by the uh, the group from Atlanta. Yeah, I guess somewhere. I don't know if we'll have no idea. Gus will probably have something. Very interesting. It's interesting how it all comes together. Yes, yes. So, but these were just pencil movements. They were the thing. Of course, if Cornelia was just there, uh, they weren't trying to, you know, uh, it was a sort of wit but it had powerful impact on this campus back in the back in the 50s in terms of a place where we were getting a whole different way of looking at all this stuff. Mm. And with, was this campus seen as a lunatic or oddballs by the city no, itself? No, it was no, highly respected. No, no. Uh, this campus, uh, that's not the way it gets figured back then. Mercer uh, is important to the town. It's important to the town, it's important to a very conservative Baptist constituency back then, relations are strained now, but it was also the scene of things like, uh, scenes like uh, heresy trials. Uh, the John Birch uh, was a native of here, but, uh, led a heresy trial against uh, Christianity professors and others uh, here. But uh, I mean, what we're saying though is that the fact that there are questions being asked on the campus. Had That's an impact true. on the town. It, that that in time would be very important. Yes. In other words, it was sort of a. I don't like to use the word liberal because that wasn't the thing there. But there was a sort of enlightened, uh, critical perspective that was kept alive all the way up through the 40s and the 50s and so on that eventually bore fruit. Right. And it bore fruit. Not because it led directly to the protest That's of the correct. sixes, but when the protest of the sixes emerged. That's correct. Uh, well, uh, a lot of the players, or some of the players, like Bill Glover, Ray Brewster, and others of us who were operative in the, the council or trying to help our corner deal when it was under siege and all that, we were, we were sort of the products of that kind of stuff back then. Yeah. But uh, to, just to be crystal clear, you're right, this, was, this did not lead to going down with some overt protest or, or against City Hall or anything. It was more like leaven in the loaf, and it was there to help out a little when the time found it. And it, together it must have had a cumulative impact. Somehow. Probably so. It's hard to know. The, you can't, you can't, you can't present the counterfactual. You can't, uh, you're absolutely right. You can't it, measure anything. Except you can in a way, because you take towns where there wasn't a council. Oh, that's the point. Or um, there wasn't any, you can't discover any sort of questioning. That's the right. 60s comes as a bit more of a shock. That's right. I'd give you one, that's right, I'd give you an example. Even Warner Robbins suggests I'd give mm. a pretty enlightened military town and all mm. that. We were filing uh, uh, discrimination complaints with Warner Robbins. Mm. And the workers would come out from here and we'd get down there and write them up for them. Some of them had not had college or high school experience. We'd write up these uh, complaints, send them in to the federal... We've been the making council human relations. Yeah, these individuals. Right. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'd be sent in to, I forget what it was, but uh, it was... Uh, uh, federal federal law having to do with uh, discrimination in federal facilities and so on mm -hmm. emerging. E uh, EEOC may have been in, I forget. Anyway, uh, they were just, across the years, there was a lot of uh, mm -hmm. efforts and institutions and uh, so on to try to deal with discrimination. So it facilitated that. 
this is the kind of thing that the place would look at that you could come to. Picture time. Yeah. And, I mean, the point we're getting to is Warner Robins. Is You're saying there, there wasn't any activity in the 50s in Warner Robins. Is that the idea? Or? 